want to um, I want to welcome um, everyone um, out in the council chambers this evening. We are uh, pleased to have uh, here this evening uh, the third city council county commissioner workshop. This indeed is a workshop, so this will be fairly informal. There's a good deal of information that is going to be presented this evening. Um, I think there's a certainly a high degree of uh, excitement and anticipation, I being among those most excited and anticipated to see what the engineers have for us this evening. But I want to welcome you and also let you know that um, after the presentation this evening, um, at seven o'clock, uh, up on the uh, Scott County Cares website, the presentation is gonna be fully available, as will be a survey, uh, where we're gonna begin collecting the feedback that is so desperately needed from across the community on this project live so that your voice becomes very much so part of this process. So I just wanted, on behalf of the City uh, Council, I wanted to welcome you. I wanted to then um, hand the microphone uh, to, uh, to Chairman Beard and then uh, we'll pass it off to the engineers. Well, Mr. Mayor, thank you. It's uh, good for us to be together again. I think this is our third. Uh, workshop on this project. It is a significant project right in the heart of the county and of course in the heart of your city. Uh, so we're looking forward to to hear uh, what kind of uh, thinking, see if there's anything outside the box that Mr. Cromie is going to share with us. And uh, with that, Mr. Mayor, we're ready to listen. Mr. Cromie. I assume red light is good, red good. in this case. <laughs> So just to, just to kind of set some expectations of what the purpose of tonight is, um, I'm gonna step you through a couple of different parts and then the two parts become the project that we're developing for, for 2019. Part one being the corridor visioning when as we look at the Highway 21 corridor all the way from County Road 82 down to Franklin Trail and how what we do in the downtown area at 1321, 21 Main, uh, how that fits in with the overall corridor. Um, we have a lot of information that we've been, uh, we've been producing and analyzing here over the last couple of months. I'm gonna sum it down as best I can. Um, we, are, we are not asking for, for your input tonight. We're not asking for decisions or direction tonight. Um, rather, we, we wanna be here and inform you as the electorate here, um, where we've been and where we're going. Um, my primary objective is for you to understand uh, the project alternatives as we get to the end of, end of the night. So certainly questions about, um, questions that help clarify um, what we're showing you uh, are, are welcome. So real quickly, where, where we've been, uh, as the mayor said, this is the third work session uh, this year. Um, we also have had a, a fair amount of, of public engagement at a corridor visioning group that has gotten together uh, twice now this summer to talk about the corridor as a whole. Um, we've had a, a, a very successful open house in June and a number of pop-up meetings where we got out, brought the meetings out to uh, the community uh, at community events. Uh, and of course, the, the Speak Up Scott County uh, Forum where we've been gathering in information and opinions and questions uh, on the project goals and how people are using the intersections. So real generally, the big takeaways that we've heard here is County Road 21 is a road to downtown, not just through downtown. I think that came out uh, very quickly uh, in the beginning and has carried through. Um, some, of these, some of these items that we've captured here are rolled into our project goals, which we, we will review. Uh, probably a big one that came out as we initiated the public involvement is there's, there's a desire or, there, or there's a readiness for change that the congestion that there is, is reaching uh, an unbearable standpoint, unacceptable standpoint. Uh, but also the uncertainty of what's gonna be done to fix the, the congestion issue um, drives the need and, and, and the community being ready for change. And as you'll see here, there are alternatives to consider. Um, 
where are we going to be going here? This is the this is basically the opening night for our phase two of the of the project, uh, where we now are going to go get information and input, answer questions about the various alternatives. So we have a, a, a number of community engagement activities occurring, be at the, the EDA on Monday, the Rotary at next, next Wednesday. Um, we have several pop-up meetings already scheduled here in September. Uh, we're getting that quarter visioning uh, work group back together uh, as well to look at how now these alternatives fit with the, the greater corridor. Uh, as always, we will have a public open house, kind of a catch-all for people to come in, uh, ask, que ask questions and get their questions answered. All of this is really building up to um, getting, to the, getting to the city council with a preferred alternative uh, for the city council to consider in November. So with that, I'm gonna ask Maddie to review the project goals. Hi everyone, um, I'm Maddie Peck. As Chris suggested or said, I'm gonna discuss the project goals and then some of that initial public input that we've been hearing in the project up to this point. Um, so you have the project goals up here and these were developed initially by our project management team, um, including city staff, county staff, consulting staff, MnDOT um, staff, and were further developed with our initial public engagement. Um, so through those first pop-up meetings, that we attended through that first corridor visioning workshop that we held. Um, we sort of further developed and further refined these goals to reflect more um, what we were hearing from the community as to what was important for this project, important to consider, and also um, some concerns that they had that um, are important to keep at the forefront of our mind. Um, so to quickly go through the project goals, they include preserving and enriching the character of downtown Prior Lake, enhancing the mobility on um, County Highway 21, so relieving that congestion that Chris talked about, maintaining enhancing local roadway systems, providing comprehensive non-motorized transportation network, providing infrastructure improvements that are compatible with the natural and human environment, developing a financially responsible plan, as well as safely accommodating all the users on the roadway. Um, so after sort of landing on those um, project goals, we really started to collect public input on those goals specifically. Um, so that was our first survey that we put out on Speak Up Scott County, was covering um, how do you feel about these goals and sort of how would you prioritize these goals? We asked um, about each goal, is this very important, somewhat important, not important? Um, and you see here we had sort of four that came out as being marked as very important. So 56, a little more than half, um, called out as enhancing that mobility and safely accommodating all users as being a top priority um, from our goals, as well as about 50% called out developing a financially responsible plan and preserving and enriching the character of downtown Prior Lake. Um, in our second survey where we asked um, more input about how people are using the corridor and who's using the corridor. Um, we asked specifically if you could only pick one priority, which would you choose? Um, and we can see here that we've got moving vehicles through the intersection more quickly and efficiently. Um, had sort of the highest response as being that top priority. Um, and before we sort of asked the question of who's, who's taking this survey, who's, who are these people responding? Um, we tried to cover that also in the survey. Um, is that something we're hearing a lot at our community engagement events that people say, well, people are just driving through, all the people are driving through, the people responding in the survey are coming through or they're the people downtown. And so we just wanted to address that directly in our survey um, and asked, if you do travel through this 1321 intersection, why why are you coming through um, through the area? And you can see here we have quite a few responses that say that they use it to access those downtown businesses in Prior Lake, um, and also a good amount that are using it to access the are using 21 um, as a regional connector. Um, another question that comes up a lot, or sort of a topic that comes up a lot, is 
who we're getting input from. And I think that this is where Scott County, or the Speak Up Forum has come in really handy because we've been talking to a lot of people who live and work downtown at our face-to-face -face, um, meetings. But the largest number of responses that we've been getting on the survey are coming from people who live in Prior Lake, but they live outside of downtown. So the people who may be coming in to use those businesses um, or using those sort of regional connections, but not necessarily living in the downtown. Um, another thing I want to make sure to note, um, and I'm going to roll into a plug for the forum, is that I've listed on all of these slides how many people have responded. Um, our first survey, we had 30 people respond with what goals they prioritize. Um, I would not jump to say that that is a statistically significant result. Um, but I also want to jump to say that we're not done collecting input. So if anybody hasn't gone and completed the surveys and wants to get their voice heard and their opinion heard on these topics, it's important to go and take the surveys and answer those questions. And even if you have already been there and already filled out the survey, um, it's good to go back and check because there's a lot, all the comments are open to the public. So you can go through and sort of see a different perspective and see a different, um, a different viewpoint maybe um, on the project. So now we'll move, we'll, I'll pass it back over to Chris and we'll talk about the corridor. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk through uh, kind of part one of the planning process that we, we went through and we engaged a, a group of, of hand-picked community leaders to help guide some of this. Um, so we looked at uh, the Conroe 21 corridor uh, all the way from Conroe 82 over to Franklin Trail realizing that the land uses, the character of the corridor changes considerably outside of this area. Uh, you really feel like you've come to Prior Lake when you're in this corridor. So that's where we, we focused our, uh, our efforts into what, what do we want this corridor to achieve? What is the message to the driver? How is this corridor gonna function uh, long term? The location and how intersections are spaced is a big part of that. Um, we, we identified a, different, a couple of different approaches to establishing primary and secondary intersections. And I should describe real quickly the difference. Uh, primary intersections are part of the overall roadway system. They connect collector streets to uh, a minor arterial. Um, they, they're meant to serve a broader uh, area, uh, land area. Uh, primary intersections are locations that we want to try to maintain full access so that people can cross Conroe 21 at primary intersections and, and make all the, all the movements necessary. So how we do that is we utilize either a through stop condition, an always stop condition, roundabout, or traffic signal. This is the way that we manage uh, primary intersections and, and vehicles and pedestrians through them. Secondary intersections are intersections that are nece more necessary for perhaps individual or smaller uh, property access. access. Um, they may be necessary because of uh, a, a group of properties may be landlocked, say by hypothetically a lake, um, and there's no other, or no other streets serving that that area. So second, secondary intersections are, are still very important, um, but because of the spacing necessary to maintain safe and efficient flow, uh, we treat them differently from, from a primary intersection. Uh, a secondary intersection can operate full access with a through stop condition, um, as long as it does so safely and efficiently. Uh, when we have problems with large delays, or we have uh, pr problems arise with crashes at secondary intersections, uh, we go a different route and we look at per perhaps a reduced conflict intersection like a right in, right out, or a, a restricted uh, uh, intersection that precludes crossing movements or left turns out, known as a three-quarter access. So as it relates to the, to the downtown area, and beyond, um, we did look at two different concepts. We did look at two different concepts for primary intersections. 
Um, this concept is, is generally consistent with the, the Conner Road 21 corridor study that was completed that identified primary intersections, of course, at Highway 13 and 21 and established the need for the Arcadia Avenue intersection. Um, went a little bit further to look at the need for primary intersections further to the west. Uh, some of our findings are that we expect traffic to continue to grow on 21, on this portion of 21. And we do expect that many of those intersections are gonna start seeing um, high delays during peak hours. So we need to start managing the intersections as primary or secondary intersections so that uh, the, the neighborhoods that are, that are adjacent there can continue to be served. The second concept that we looked at is more consistent with conditions that are out there today. Um, with Main Avenue and Duluth Avenue serving as kind of a dual purpose primary intersection and then a secondary intersection at Arcadia. We also had a couple of alternatives further to the west that are more, more or less independent from what we do downtown, um, but there is some relation in, in how the primary intersections serve the various neighborhoods. So we'll take a look at this uh, real quickly. Concept A, the, the red arrows that you show here coming out, that we show here coming out of the primary intersections, um, generally just show that the street network that is present or could be present to serve the various neighborhoods. West Avenue, for example, uh, is a pretty reasonable north-south collector street that, that connects many of the, the smaller uh, dead-end streets or cul-de-sac streets in those neighborhoods. <coughs> and then, of course, the, the Arcadia Avenue intersection uh, illustrates the intent of that intersection is to connect the downtown areas from Duluth down to Pleasant. So as we, we'll, as we look at downtown under concept A, It's important that we consider how those uh, intersections serve access into downtown from each direction. So coming from the north, you see under concept A with <clears throat> Arcadia Avenue being the primary intersection. The, the primary access from the north, uh, you have several options to really access, getting access into downtown. Numerous opportunities both on the north side and, and south side of downtown. And then as we look at different concepts here shortly, you'll see that there are other areas that we, we will be looking at uh, a secondary or alternate access to further enhance uh, access to a particular part of downtown. From the south, you can see the access into downtown becomes a little more difficult. Um, and it's, it's clear why there, there was resistance to this concept a number of years ago. That your first access point, if you're coming from the south, is really you gotta go through downtown to Arcadia uh, Avenue. Some of the secondary locations where there are right turns from a secondary access point uh, are there. So the north side is accessed pretty well. And then of course, uh, needing alternatives to uh, provide additional access to the south side at either Pleasant or Main Avenue. From the east, it's similar to the, as from the south that the primary intersection at Arcadia and serves in many directions as the first access point with secondary access by right-hand turns. And then alternate access that we'll be looking at on how to provide a couple of ways into downtown. From the west, this works pretty well. The first access point that you encounter is Arcadia and you can get to both sides 
of downtown with secondary access points uh, via right-hand turns. In addition to access into downtown, we looked at how vehicles and pedestrians would get across, not across town. So certainly with a, with a secondary access at Maine, we would expect some traffic to utilize Highway 13 to uh, between Dakota and Pleasant Street uh, to, to access one side or the other. And certainly at Arcadia, you'd have two primary crossing points for, for motorists. Under this uh, concept, there would be multiple opportunities for pedestrian crossings across downtown. Um, we can provide uh, pedestrian crossings at secondary intersections, and in some cases, uh, better pedestrian crossings at secondary intersections with restricted access because you have fewer conflicts with vehicles. And then as part of the work that we're doing with the corridor is we are trying to identify ways to incorporate non-motorized travel, uh, uh, in particular the Scott West Regional Trail that follows the south side of 21 and providing some connectivity then to late downtown and then ultimately Lakefront Park. It'll get, it'll get more interesting here real quick. Um, so con concept B, this is, the, this is the, the new concept that we're looking at for access. We're looking at primary intersections at, at Maine and Duluth, and then how different alternatives can, you can access into downtown. So under concept B, access from the north, uh, it's very similar. Uh, you get that, that left turn onto Maine because you have a primary intersection at Maine. And with secondary, again, downtown is very permeable if you're coming from the north. You have that Maine Avenue intersection, that signal. Um, you know that you're in downtown as you, as you come through. From the south, uh, you can see you have better access into downtown at, at the primary intersections and potential for secondary uh, access at the Arcadia intersection. For, so for those who, who may uh, criticize the, the work that's been done at Arcadia, we will, under this concept, we will still utilize that infrastructure the best that we can. Um, so the, the decisions in the past um, won't, be, won't be wasted. From the east, similarly, access using Maine, uh, downtown become, it is, remains very permeable with secondary access at Arcadia from the west. Still works pretty well. So going through this process, I think the, the project team recognized the change that was being proposed and, the, and it emphasizes the need to, to potentially look at, at other alternatives as a whole. And then crossing uh, Highway 21 similarly would be at the, prim the two primary intersections. And again, multiple ways for pedestrians to cross Highway 21. So from a corridor standpoint, uh, there are really two, two concepts to consider. The first being the primary intersection on 21 being at Arcadia. The second being the primary intersections being at Duluth and Main Avenue. That's part one. We'll move on to part two. I'm gonna have Jake walk through uh, what we were looking at solely at the Highway 13 and 21 
intersection for traffic control because we do have alternatives there as well. I just want to emphasize that as this map illustrates, the 2113 intersection is a very important intersection for, the, for countywide travel. Uh, there are very few east-west uh, connections across, um, as there are just a few north-south with 2717. So maintaining mobility, safety in that intersection is clearly a, an equal priority to providing access uh, into downtown. Hi, I'm Jake Bonger with Bolton and Mank. Um, so yeah, we'll be discussing the, the intersection control alternatives that were explored at 1321. I'm kind of wading into the, the corridor concepts that we'll be reviewing here. And the two primary alternatives that we looked at were a traffic signal and a roundabout at the intersection. So with the addition of, I guess with looking at both of these traffic controls, there was an understanding that we do have a capacity issue at this intersection where lanes would need to be added if it does remain a traffic signal um, or if a, a, new traffic, or a new traffic control alternative was introduced, we'd have to ensure that enough lanes are provided to move traffic efficiently through the intersection. So the two concepts that were reviewed were first off a traffic signal. Um, in addition to what's currently out there today, um, we would be providing exclusive eastbound and westbound left and right turn lanes. So part of the existing, part of, part of the issue with the existing intersection is the, the signal timing out there is prohibited by the need to provide individual movement or independent movements to eastbound and westbound traffic because of the lack of turn lanes. And by doing that, it takes time away that can be allocated to 13 and also 21 mainline movements. Um, so the presence in, in providing exclusive left and right turn lanes, it, it opens up a lot of options for us. Um, we're also looking at Trunk Highway 13 providing dual northbound and southbound left turn lanes. This will also provide a little bit of extra capacity just to help move vehicles through the intersection. Um, and as discussed, the traffic signal timing is, would be one of the, the primary improvements at this intersection. And in providing those eastbound and westbound left turn lanes, eliminating that split phasing, it does open up a lot more time. Um, as we talk about the roundabout concept as being a second alternative, um, because of the traffic volumes that we do expect out there, I guess that are out there currently and that we do expect in the future, it would require a multi-lane roundabout. Um, so something similar to 50, 60, or Cassatt 50, Cassatt 60 in Dakota County, if you guys have ever traveled through that intersection, um, that'd be a good one to go off of. Um, with the, the single lane of approach, northbound and southbound, um, north and south of the intersection on Trunk Highway 13. We would provide an, addition, an expansion from a single lane to two lanes entering the roundabout um, near Pleasant Avenue going, or Pleasant Street going north and um, near Dakota going south. So it would be one lane coming in, expanding out to two through the roundabout and then lessening back down to one on the other side. Uh, on, t on Cassaw 21, we would be providing a continuous two lanes in both directions, maintaining that existing section that we have out there. So I'm gonna kind of break the discussion of these, these two intersection alternatives into two options, or I guess two different segments, one being traffic operations and the other one being safety. So beginning with traffic operations, as just kind of a, a starting point, currently the intersection operates at a level of service D during the AM, which is that between 40 and 54 seconds um, of delay per or seconds per vehicle entering the intersection. So it's a level of service D in the AM and a level of service F in the PM with about 90 seconds of delay. So by introducing the traffic signal alternative with the lanes that we had discussed um, on the previous slide, we would expect an intersection level service D during both the AM and PM peaks hours. So from the very beginning, we'd be, see, be seeing acceptable traffic operations and an improvement in moving vehicles through the intersection. Um, as we get to 20, or, and then if we look at the roundabout under that same scenario being 2017, we would expect an intersection level service A. So the roundabout would, would very efficiently move traffic through the intersection, um, both of them being acceptable, but in looking at this, the efficiencies um, that would be provided by the roundabout are expected to be greater than the traffic signal. As we look further out in the year 2040, 
Um, we do start to see um, some delays beginning to build again with the traffic signal, but the inter intersection level service E is still far greater than anything we'd expect in the no build scenario. Um, it is it is near acceptable, and I guess it is acceptable, and we would only expect it to exceed level service E or greater for about two to three hours a day. So just during those peak conditions, um, we would expect it to climb into that range, but it would still expect it to be less delay than what you see currently during the PM peak. Um, as we move into the, the roundabout discussion in 2040, we would expect in the AM a level service D or 25 to 34 seconds of delay. So we do again expect very efficient operations with the roundabout um, during the, or, and then during both the AM and the PM peak hour. So the PM would be a level service B a little bit lower. And overall as the intersection as a whole, we would expect there to be no hours of the day that would operate at level service E or worse. Um, so in looking at the intersection as a whole, we also looked at um, the operations and performance of individual movements. As Chris mentioned, our conversation has been um, looking at providing effective movements to downtown, um, I guess in addition to through downtown. So we separated it from both local movements and regional movements. So yeah, the vehicles that are traveling just through the intersection, um, going to work and whatnot, and those traveling to downtown. And we found that overall the roundabout does provide more efficient operations um, for both those local and regional trips. From a safety perspective, uh, splitting it into vehicles and pedestrians, uh, beginning with vehicles, what we, what we typically expect for a traffic signal is, um, so 0.7 crashes per million entering vehicles. Um, to put that in more, I guess, digestible terms, it, that, that boils down to about seven crashes per year given the traffic volumes that you guys have out here. Um, if, we, if, a, if a roundabout were introduced at this location, we'd expect those volumes to increase, or the, the crashes to increase to about 1.4 crashes per million entering vehicles, which would be about 14 crashes per year. So we'd expect somewhere in the range of, of twice as many crashes given the, the complexity of the multi-lane roundabout and just the kind of the uncertainty in, as you proceed through the intersection. Um, with that being said, the, the fatal and serious injury crashes expected at the intersection. Um, so we have a rate of 0.97 um, per 100 million entering vehicles for a traffic signal, which boils down to one fatal or serious injury crash probably every five to 10 years. Um, if we translate that to the, if we look at the roundabout, that would be more so looking at one fatal or serious injury crash every 10 to 20 years. Um, so those crashes are very few and far, and be far between uh, throughout the county as a whole and throughout the state as a whole. Um, but one of the benefits that we'd see is just an overall reduction in injury crashes with the roundabout. Um, one of the main concerns that we have with a traffic signal is the right angle crash that's introduced with it. So if you have a vehicle traveling northbound and one traveling eastbound, if a vehicle to, were to run the stoplight and hit a vehicle traveling eastbound, that's a high impact crash and that's one that we often see severe crashes with. What a roundabout does is it forces all vehicles traveling through the intersection to slow down to a speed of about 20 miles an hour as a typical design speed and it, it removes that conflict, that right angle conflict of two vehicles just hitting each other in that nature. It's mostly merging crashes and side swipe crashes. Um, so while there would be more crashes, likely twice as many crashes, we'd expect to be about half as many injury crashes with the application of a roundabout. Um, from a pedestrian standpoint, the driver compliance for, or for stopping for a pedestrian within a crosswalk is, is very high at a traffic signal. The red light comes up for a vehicle to stop and then the, the walk symbol comes up for the pedestrian and they walk across the intersection. Um, so we typically say that's near 100%. Um, in a roundabout, it's a little different situation. There aren't lights necessarily controlling the vehicles entering the, the intersection and it's, it's not as night and day, I guess, when someone needs to stop for a pedestrian. So a study that was completed by University of Minnesota showed that on average, the compliance rate's about 45%, so about half that of a traffic signal. Um, so it is much lower than, than what we'd expect at a signal, but the wait times at a signal 
um, for a pedestrian crossing would be higher. So with the signal, um, the, the current signal timing at 1321, it's, it's about 170 si seconds to get through an entire cycle. So if you were to go out there and push the button to cross the road, you may have to wait, you'd, you'd have to wait uh, an extended period of time, typically 60 to 90 seconds in order to cross the roadway. Um, with a roundabout, while the compliance is a little bit lower um, for a pedestrian or for a vehicle stopping, um, you do typically get to enter the intersection quicker. So we'd expect somewhere in the range of a 10 second wait time. So while it, it's, it's a little more uncertain whether a vehicle approaching is gonna stop, you have to be a little more aware of your surroundings. We do expect it to be less of a wait time for pedestrians crossing the intersection. So just as a summary, the two different traffic control alternatives that we did review was a traffic signal and a multi-lane roundabout. Um, from our findings from both an operations and a safety standpoint, both seem to be viable options um, as we move forward into the discussion with the corridor. Thank you, Jake. So that's part two of this puzzle uh, to put together um, alternatives for a project. Um, clearly, I think you're starting to see this isn't easy um, where you, when you start having to pick safety over mobility, injuries over total number of crashes um, at, the, at the intersection of the whole. So what are the alternatives here that we're looking for, that we're looking at? Uh, there are four of them, magically two part one concepts paired with two part two concepts uh, leads us to four concepts uh, for that 2019 project. Um, we've prepared this, you know, looking at the, the range of performance measures. Um, as I get to the alternatives here, uh, some terminology we should clear up um, when I start talking about alternatives. Uh, this was this was a pretty big task of ours to try to figure out what to call these things. Um, generally, it follows the corridor concept A and the intersection control one or two, uh, A or B. So A1, that includes a primary intersection at Arcadia with the traffic signal at Highway 13. A2 includes the primary intersection at, at Arcadia with the roundabout at Highway 13. Likewise, B2 is a primary intersection at Main Avenue with the traffic signal at Highway 13, and B2 is the Main Avenue with the roundabout at Highway 13. So let's, uh, let's take a look at these. I'll introduce them first, and then I'll come back to each of them uh, with an with a overall summa summary of how they how they perform against our goals. There we go. That was, that was not intentional. <laughs> so the, the A1 alternative, uh, this, is, this is consistent with the corridor study and the recommendation from, from 2005. It includes a, a traffic signal at Arcadia and a traffic signal at Highway 13. Uh, it includes a secondary intersection at Pleasant with that northbound left turn lane. Uh, the addition on it is an enhanced offset pedestrian crossing at Main Avenue. Maybe I should ask the question, everybody got their bearings straight where north is up? Okay. A2. This is the primary intersection again at Arcadia with a roundabout at Arcadia as well as at a roundabout at Highway 13. And then mixed in there are three quarter accesses 
at Duluth and Maine. The three quarter accesses are meant to provide, um, accommodate the crossing movement at Maine that would be restricted by a median by utilizing the roundabouts on either end. The roundabouts are very conducive to U-turn or what would be a U-turn at a, at a traditional signalized intersection. There, I should have mentioned this, there are four primary alternatives that we're looking at. There are variations to these. One of the variations to this one could be a, uh, a traffic signal at Arcadia could function. Um, it would be a cost saving measure because of the infrastructure that is there today, uh, but it would be at the cost of uh, facilitating some of those U-turns as, as efficiently. B1, this is the main avenue primary intersection controlled by a traffic signal along with a traffic signal at Highway 13. The, the key to make this work is a, a, is a coordinated traffic signal between the two uh, where they would have to be tied, the phase on main and 21 would have to be tied to the, the phase at 13 and 21. This option includes a roundabout at Duluth Avenue as, a prime, as, as a, another primary intersection and to address some of the, the safety issues that are there today. That too could be a signal, it would be independent of the, of the two signals at, at Main and, and Highway 13. And then what we do at Arcadia, um, there are a couple of alternatives. We have providing left turns there to help alleviate some of the pressure on the traffic signal at Main Avenue um, itself. I see a lot of head nodding, so there must be some general understanding. And then B2, this also is a primary intersection at Main Avenue. Uh, it includes a total of three roundabouts at each of the primary intersections, Duluth, Main, and Highway 13. And again, there are some alternatives in what we can do at Arcadia to provide secondary access into and out of downtown for both pedestrians and, and motorists. Uh, we do have some concern with this concept because of the closely spaced roundabouts that while not on an average condition or what we really would expect on a regular basis, um, a vehicle in the main avenue roundabout, either making a left-hand turn or coming through, could become the controlling factor for that intersection as well as the Highway 13, 21 intersection. Uh, if one roundabout backs up into another, all four legs in each of the, of the intersections back up. This is, a, this is a concern that, that we have as, as practitioners. It's not a substantiated expectation that that's gonna happen, say, every peak hour starting in year 10. Um, as we model this, we, we model this as, as working. This may have an alternative where it was suggested in the community that perhaps there are peak hour restrictions um, where certain movements are precluded from happening at certain times of day, i.e. the crossing at Main. So those are the four primary, um, primary alternatives that we're, we're, we're looking at. I think when we added up, did we ever add, totally add up the variations? We were at 12 at one point. Um, you know, moving this left-hand turn to a different location. Um, and that's likely, you know, likely to, to dwindle down here as we, as we narrow things down and make things, make things work. But each of these alternatives were, were evaluated uh, based on the goals that, that Maddie reviewed earlier uh, and measures of effectiveness 
on each of those goals themselves. So goals of the corridor character, non-motorized network, the, the vehicle and pedestrian safety, corridor mobility, local roadways, uh, the cost of the improvements, uh, and just overall feasibility um, with fit in the environment. I have a, I have uh, various notes on the findings. I'm going to I'm going to summarize what I think are the 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 key takeaways on each of these options. So we'll start back to to A1. Uh, this is the traffic signal at Arcadia and a traffic signal at Highway 13. Um, this option. Some of the key benefits of this option, this one has the lowest property impacts when compared to other alternatives. Uh, some of the alternatives that you saw there had uh, more than 20 different properties being impacted. Uh, this one, we were estimated about 10 properties uh, could be impacted um, with this, with this uh, design. Uh, it also is, it provides the best pedestrian crossing performance on 21 because you have two traffic signals, one at Highway 13, one at Arcadia, where a pedestrian can choose to utilize that traffic control device to cross. It also includes a, an enhanced offset crossing at Main Avenue that would have uh, a traffic control device there activated by the pedestrian. Um, that is showing, uh, showing some good promise uh, throughout the state for uh, safety and, and mobility. This, this uh, also ranks highest in, in the driver and pedestrian safety uh, aspect because of the high yield rates that we would expect at the signalized intersections and at the main avenue crossing. Some of the key challenges, as I pointed out in, uh, earlier, uh, this one does have fewer downtown access points, particularly from, from the west. That, <clears throat> that this one only has, a, has the one access point coming from the west before it becomes very circuitous to, to access downtown. <clears throat> this one also has less efficient traffic operations overall on the corridor because of the higher delay that we would expect at traffic signals, as Jake pointed out at Highway 13 and 21, the, the, we would still expect a fair amount of delay uh, at the intersection controlled by the traffic signals. And lastly, and certainly not least, this one d did come in as the highest project cost, and I'll, uh, I'll get into that into a little bit more detail um, here in a, la in a later slide. Overall, what I would, uh, what you can expect as community leaders here, as the public, comparing and contrasting this with other alternatives, uh, this, is your, this is your stop and go alternative on 21. Uh, when, the, when the green lights are up, traffic is going to move, and they're going to move at, or I'll say near, the posted speed limits through the corridor. Um, when, the, when the lights are red, uh, traffic will back up. The, the other thing, as I, as I tried to kind of wrap my arms around what's different with this one, is, is how it creates kind of the vehicle access is really on the perimeters of downtown and the main avenue 21 intersection becomes very pedestrian orientated that you get into and out of downtown from arcadia maine some of the other perimeter locations pedestrian activity is focused at main avenue you've separated those out so let's take a look at that pedestrian crossing in a little bit more detail because it's an it's a important uh, feature to this option. So I mentioned this, this crossing is an offset crossing. 
So on the, the, the illustration on the right uh, illustrates the, the, the crossing. And what that does for the pedestrian is it makes the decision to cross the roadway much simpler because now they have to assess traffic coming from one direction in just the two lanes that are, that are coming at them. They can choose a gap in that in the eastbound traffic if you're moving from south to north. You can choose a gap in the eastbound traffic, cross safely to the median. They now have a different decision to make as they walk along the median to choose a gap in the westbound traffic. Separating these, separating these two uh, decision points does yield a safer crossing. In addition to the way we have this positioned on the approaching uh, lanes to the intersection, you also don't have to worry about the right-hand turn vehicle coming behind you and, and pulling out as they're looking left, looking for the same gap in traffic as the pedestrian is to cross. The illustrations to the left um, are meant to illustrate uh, what, it's, what this is like for the, for the driver coming down Highway 21. So the driver is aware that there is a uh, activity occurring there. This isn't uh, hit the gas and move through. You can see we have some vertical elements to it. We have a uh, pedestrian actuated overhead uh, con uh, traffic control device, warning device there. So you will know when, you've, when you're approaching this, this part of, of downtown. The pedestrian on Main, you can see there's a vertical element to it there as well to see that you're, you can't simply see across uh, like you do today and feel like you can simply run across. Um, there would be, there would be um, some structure there to prevent the law-abiding pedestrian from simply running across. It'll channel them in. There would be barriers on either side, so you'd enter the median at a particular location, walk along it, and then cross uh, at the other opening. We've identified this type of pedestrian treatment here because this is where we have known pedestrian crossings. And through our, through our normal traffic study, the average weekday, uh, the pedestrian traffic generally isn't that high, uh, less than 20 pedestrians in any given hour, which is, is a pretty light pedestrian uh, crossing, uh, particularly for a downtown area. Uh, we also have data from when the farmer's market's in session, and that is not light. Uh, we had more than 200 pedestrians crossing the morning in one hour, uh, the morning of the farmer's market. So there is a pedestrian demand, albeit for special events, uh, but this is a downtown area and special events should be expected in a, in a downtown area. Any questions yet on, on the concepts before I get into the cost of this concept? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Cromie, um, on the roundabouts, um, or I'm sorry, on uh, the slides you had here, B1, B2, uh, I noticed the left turn lanes on the east bound 21 to the north 13 move. Can you picture that? Both of those lanes are short. And one of the things we had discussed in a previous workshop, um, yeah, either one of these, was that the um, uh, Part of the thing that was needed was the amount of traffic moving east on 21 that was turning north on 13, and particularly in the morning, needed a longer or needed some more staging area for that left turn move. Um, if we do um, any of these, I notice that seems to be a bit shorter. Are you going to get into the impacts of what that means, or will you be considering that for some future presentation? We, on both the B1 and the A1, I noticed I, that's the case. I'll answer your question, but I should have 
clarified any questions on A1. Okay. I, uh, I, I don't uh, want to uh, get into jumping between the options too much, but sure. I do want to make sure that it's understood. And, well, and, on the A1, it, it's the same thing. On the, and the A1 slide, um, is that the one you wanted to ask questions on? Yes. Short turn lane, northbound 13. So, so the, tur the turn lane lengths um, that we've identified are what we believe are going to be necessary okay. to handle the traffic that, that will be there in the future. Mm -hmm. So we'll call it adequate turn lane length. Right. Uh, we're not substandard. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know, standard. It's, it's what's necessary based on the demand expected. Under the B1 option, since you brought it up, um, to make that work, that requires a larger footprint width of 21 in order to get the turn lane length necessary for eastbound 21 to northbound 13, mm -hmm. side by side with a westbound left turn lane to south on Main. Gotcha. Those two left turn lanes would be side by side, pushing the width of the roadway wider. Well, now I won't have to ask my B1 question when you get to that thing. <laughs> We're good, thanks. Any other A1 questions from the, yeah. the, the board or council? We'll get into the, the cost of A1. I mentioned this one uh, appears to be our, our more, most expensive of the four option alternatives. Um, and it's most expensive not necessarily because of what we're doing on Highway 1321. It's what we need to do to make it work. Um, First and foremost, uh, consistent with the corridor plan, we've, we've included the 1.3 million for the Arcadia Avenue intersection down to Pleasant Street because we feel under this option, it's most, that connection is most necessary for the circulation within downtown. And that's consistent with the, with the, the previous um, recommendations. And that 1.3 million includes the, the property acquisi acquisition as well as the construction of that one block street extension. Probably more notably, uh, that Pleasant Street connection, uh, that's an expensive fix, or that's an exp expensive uh, extension. We have preliminary results from, from soil borings that in indicate that the poor soils that are there, the unstable soils that are there, are down 40 to 50 feet below the existing roadway. So the fix on Highway 13 alone um, is looking at about a 1.1 $1 to $1.2 million fix just to keep the existing Highway 13 from continuing to sink. For the Pleasant Street connection, that northbound left-hand turn, uh, similarly, the options are, are, are limited uh, in there it would be a little bit different approach where we would need to, to do some pile driving there to establish a stable base in order to build, in order to build a surface in which we could build a roadway. Um, that is estimated preliminarily at $2.5 million uh, before we do any roadway construction. So a couple of those things um, lead this one to be uh, a, a more expensive uh, option than some of the other ones that you'll you'll see, and not to sound wishy-washy on the cost of that Pleasant Street connection, um, we have just two pieces of information for, of soil borings that we were able to obtain within the highway right away. Uh, if the Pleasant Street connection uh, is desired to move forward. Um, we would recommend getting into onto private property, getting permission to do that, and get some additional drilling. But the, all indications on the information we do have is the depth of, the, of, of those wetland facilities is down 50 feet below the, the existing roadway, 30 feet below the existing wetland surface. This uh, A1, before we completely throw this one out because of cost, uh, there are some alternatives to this Pleasant Street connection. Um, one alternative would be to facilitate that, let that northbound or that access to the south part of downtown from the south with a left turn on 21 at Main. So 
that uh, there, is, there are options to, that, that can make this uh, a more palatable uh, from a cost perspective. Yes, Mr. Gromy, so in, in just in contemplating this uh, A1 then, so if we left the Pleasant Street just right in, right out as it is at this very moment, we could almost, we could knock 3.7 million off of here. No, actually, the 13 correction needs to happen anyhow, doesn't it? Correct. Where it goes through the old slough there? Yep, the 13 correction w will need to happen. Okay, so that's kind of, that 1.2 million will be, should be in, well, I want to ask about B12 and <laughs> I'll let you it, get to those It, it does back. vary a bit okay. um, based on the potential need for widening in that area. Okay. Uh, it gets more expensive yeah. the wider the, the corridor becomes. Well, it seems to me while we're tearing up the turf, we might as well fix that mess on 13 while it's there, but just an observation. Okay, thanks. So I'll move on to the, the A2 option. This, this, to remind everyone, this is a primary intersection at Arcadia with the roundabout at Highway 13 and a roundabout at Arcadia. Um, some of the key benefits here for this one, uh, this, this too has more minimal property impacts. Uh, gen generally, roundabouts have a bigger right-of-way footprint at the intersection and a narrower corridor leading up to the intersection when compared to, to traffic signals, and that's true in this case as well. Um, because uh, much of the property is already acquired at Arcadia, a roundabout can fit in that location. From a traffic operation standpoint, this one, this one uh, moves traffic very efficiently. Uh, very low delays caused by the intersections themselves because the conflicts are being worked out within the intersection. It's utilizing the gaps in traffic by the various directions uh, quite well. This option also in my opinion, best accommodates the local and regional trips. I shouldn't even say that, not in my opinion. It does based on the operational analysis of the 1321 uh, intersection. Uh, what is attractive to this alternative is the permeability that it creates with downtown. Uh, yes, we restrict access at Main Avenue, but that crossing movement can be made by a right-hand turn, a U-turn at your nearest roundabout, either at 13 or 20, 13 or Arcadia, and, and that permeability is there. It puts, puts less strain on the local street system than the than A1 alternative does. Please. So at, at Main Avenue, uh, westbound is right in, right out. Commissioner Wolf, if you would hit your microphone for those at home. I'm sorry. So is that a right in, right out only at Main? It's a, it's a right in, right out for westbound traffic. It's a right in, right out and a left turn to Main for eastbound traffic. Mr. Cromie, if I could ask uh, on this, uh, the the, if you're coming east on 21, you've got access to Main Street going north. Uh, I notice if, if you're going west on 21, you do not have access to Main Street going south. Any thoughts on that, if you could include that or not? So your, your question is, is coming from the east, access uh, to the north part of downtown versus the south part of downtown? If you're heading, it, my question is, if you're heading west on County Road 21, this doesn't allow access to the south part of Main Street. You, you can't go south. It, Is that possible? It does provide access via the Pleasant and Highway 13 intersection that's there today. So at the 1321 intersection, you would go three quarters of the way around the roundabout and make a right-hand turn at Pleasant Street. 
as currently configured as well, you'd have the U-turn option through the roundabout at Arcadia as well to come back on it. Correct. <clears throat> please. Again, your microphone, please, so you Ms. Have, Thank you. So roundabout there on 1321 in this next one at Arcadia. Would you, I don't know if I saw another where, where there was a roundabout at Duluth, would you? Under this option, we have a, a three-quarter intersection at Duluth, oh, you do. where okay. you would, where we would accommodate uh, right-hand turns and a left-hand, a westbound left-hand turn. Um, similarly, the Arcadia roundabout would facilitate the northbound Duluth left by making a right-hand turn and making the U-turn through the roundabout itself. So this ties. Those, those intersections together and provides the circulation in downtown through the roundabout corridor on, on Conroe 21. Couple of the, couple of the drawbacks that I, that, I, that I would identify on this, um, as Jake mentioned, the, the high number of crashes that we would expect um, because of the, the full multi-lane at, at Highway 13, 21. So there may be more crashes occurring there, um, but from a safety standpoint, uh, you'd less, be l much less likely to be injured in a crash in this corridor. Um, another key challenge that we have as a project team is this, this alternative is considerably different than the alternative that we proposed to the Met Council and received federal, federal funding for. So I would be amiss to not inform you that that federal funding could be reduced. Um, with this option, um, we would certainly need to go through a, a scope change with them to, to try to confirm the, the federal funding. And then pedestrian safety is, and again, building off of what Jake said, um, with the lower yield rates at pedestrian crossings, at roundabouts, um, be a, a little bit more concerned about pedestrian safety in a multi-lane roundabout corridor. From a, from a what you what you can expect, you know, I mentioned the. The A1 concept, that's your stop and go option. A higher variation in, in speeds, this is quite the opposite. Um, with roundabouts on either side, designed to move traffic through those intersections at 15 to 20 miles per hour, you would expect to have lower overall travel speeds through downtown um, because of the, the controlling factor um, that the roundabouts provide. Um, and I already mentioned this too, uh, this option um, would result in less burden or less demand on some of the local streets for downtown circulation, uh, namely Colorado Street and Dakota Street. Some of the uh, areas where we heard concerns were with making uh, the Arcadia Avenue as a primary intersection. So again, uh, this concept would have an enhanced pedestrian uh, crossing at Main Avenue, again, similar to A1, it would focus vehicle access on the perimeters of downtown with the core uh, area of Main Avenue where most of your business activity is, um, be focused on pedestrian. Similar, we could do a similar thing, uh, we wouldn't be able to do an offset um, crossing here, but we could provide a pedestrian activated um, warning device, overhead warning device, so that pedestrian pushes a button, alerts drivers that there's a pedestrian there um, committed to crossing the roadway. This option you can see uh, is, is considerably lower priced than the, than the first option we looked at. Uh, more roadway cost because we'd be building uh, two primary intersections versus versus the one. Um, rebuilding some of the, of the Arcadia Avenue intersection. 
a um, little bit narrower footprint on Highway 13 because we don't have all the turn lanes coming up to, so we're less likely to have to do the, the widening or incur additional costs for widening of Highway 13 through that soil correction area. Um, and then a little bit higher cost we would expect in property acquisition. Shall I move on or are there are questions about A2? Councilmember Thompson. What's going on at the loop? Yeah, because under, under this corridor concept, Duluth is a secondary intersection. Um, so it would be a, a, a reduced access intersection. The northbound left hand turn to go westbound on 21 um, would be removed and it would be facilitated by, by a U-turn at the Arcadia Avenue intersection. Coming from the east would be the same. You'd have the, a dedicated left-hand turn uh, to the intersection. Same with west, you'd be able to make the, the right-hand turn in and out of Duluth. Mr. Schill. Question on the, the pedestrian safety Roundabout, is it possible to improve the pedestrian function there with some of those enhanced uh, mechanisms as well by giving drivers warning that people are getting ready to enter? And Absolutely. Does it make cost sense? I don't know what the pedestrian movements are of those two. Yeah, ab absolutely. There are there are alternatives, there are measures that we could take to improve the pedestrian crossing at roundabouts. Council Member, or Commissioner Ulrich. Yeah, I have a question on the, um, the process with the TAB and on this Met Council with the uh, project. Um, if this needs to be a scope change and, and potentially rescored, um, it's not a question of losing some money, it's a question of losing all the money, isn't it? It, it could be all the money or it could be a, a reduced portion of it. Because mm -hmm. I, I uh, worry that this is so different that it would, um, they wouldn't just say we're going to give you less because of the project scope, but I think this might be rescored. And I don't know how much would the above the next project we were. It's a, it's strictly a point system, and if it is rescored, then we would draw, could drop below the next project and lose all that funding. So it, in a sense, wouldn't it make this one of the more expensive projects if we lost it, all our federal funding? It could become more more expensive to the, to the county and city. Yes. Okay. Just want to clarify. Uh, Councilmember Council McGuire. Uh, th thank you, Mayor. Mr. Cromie, it seems to me that the 7.3 is a bis bit misleading. You should almost add in the 2.5 for the Pleasant Avenue. I mean, going up and using the roundabout and taking a left turn at Arcadia is really a, I think we would still need the uh, northbound uh, Pleasant Avenue access. You, you certainly could have it, but one of the, the benefits of the roundabout corridor and having roundabouts on, on either end is the ability to facilitate that circulation with less burden on that, that local street. left is provided here, and since we no longer have... Hmm. Um, with the concept that's provided here, um, so the Pleasant Street or the Pleasant Connection is provided with the signal alternative, and we do need to lower that connection down to swoop up because of the turn lane requirements at the 1321 intersection for that northbound left turn movement. With the roundabout, those turn lanes are removed, and we're only providing two lanes into the roundabout, so that allows us to keep that 13 at Pleasant intersection at the same spot it currently is today. So that movement is still, that northbound left onto Pleasant is still provided just at a much cheaper price because we don't need to do all the soil corrections. Uh, I guess a, a comment I'd like to make as well relative to the federal funding, and I'm gonna look here at Lisa Freeze. Certainly when we submitted to, for that funding, there was no knowledge of the condition of those soils. So. Um, and what the cost would be for a mediation under 13 and that three-quarter access. 
So before I think we bemoan the loss of federal funds um, for a given design, the cost of actually implementing what was in that original plan has gone up significantly based on the need to remediate those soils. Would that be a, a correct assessment as I'm looking here at Lisa Freeze? <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, um, commissioners and uh, council members, that is correct assumption that uh, um, that cost was not included in the original application. There was a risk factor that was in there though um, that would account for a portion of that. Um, the, the challenge that we're gonna have um, with a new concept is exactly as uh, um, uh, Commissioner Ulrich suggested, is that they will rescore it um, with a cost increase. They look at the percentage increase before they cha change their um, award. Thank you. Shall we move on? Concept B1, the, the main avenue primary intersection. This is the one with the traffic signal at both main avenue and at Highway 13, uh, that's spaced approximately 400 feet apart. Um, and because of that close proximity, um, we would need to tie those two signals together so that traffic can flow through both intersections on 21 and clear the, clear the intersection. Um, this option, from some key benefits, this option does provide uh, the most downtown access points or the potential for the most downtown access points, uh, providing left turns in at Arcadia, as well as at Main, crossing at Main, um, can work uh, can work quite quite well for for movements to and from the north part and south part of of downtown. Um, the managed traffic movements simply means that we control it um, by using traffic signals that are um, certainly have computer controls. Um, we put the parameters in which how that those two traffic signals work. Um, when you compare a roundabout alternative, um, we don't control how traffic moves through roundabouts. We do uh, with a with a, a traffic signal and the, the two coordinated movements here. Um, this, what, this option uh, does provide, uh, does come in at, at one of the lower costs and we'll get into that. You'll see it's not by a lot, um, but it, it, it is a, a lower cost option. And again, it's primarily because we're now providing the full access at Main instead of mitigating uh, an, an access restriction at Main with the Pleasant Street connection. Um, overall, this, this one compares to um, A1 from a traffic operation standpoint. This is gonna be your stop and go option. Um, when, the, when the red light's up, people are gonna be stopped. When it's green, they're gonna be on the gas, uh, traveling at or near the posted speed through, through downtown. Um, we, do, we do expect considerable delay um, at the signalized intersection. Um, I should point out on this graphic, uh, there is a, a drawback, a considerable drawback to think about for Main Avenue. Um, the cars that you illustrate, that we have illustrated on there, um, that's what we expect in the af in an average afternoon of 10 to 12 vehicles waiting for that green light on Main Avenue to get, to get across 21. So you should expect to have traffic stacked into downtown um, in order for those signal systems to operate uh, efficiently. And it's really a hierarchy of that signal system. Um, we, know, we know that MnDOT places a priority on Highway 13 movement. Um, we've been living with that for, for years out here. Uh, the next priority is gonna be County Road 21, Main Avenue is gonna be the lower priority and to get these two closely spaced uh, intersection signals to operate um, for 21, it's gonna require um, some pretty substantial delays in queuing on Main Avenue. 
this option um, two presents the um, potential for the highest crash severity with, with two signalized intersections close, closely spaced, uh, vehicles crossing one another at right angles and, at, and with uh, uh, highly variable speed differentials, um, traveling someplace between you know, 35 and zero, um, higher than that on, on 13 itself. So again, as I compare and contrast, what, what can you expect on this one? Again, this is, this is your stop and go option. High variability of speeds through the corridor and through downtown uh, and, the, and the vehicles stacked uh, on Main Avenue um, through the, that afternoon peak period um, in order to keep traffic moving. That has the potential to affect how parked vehicles, get, how people get in and out of park parking spots. Um, it really does create some congestion for you in downtown. Um, comparing and contrasting to the other alternatives where, we've, where we separate out the vehicle uh, access to the perimeters of downtown, uh, this one keeps the, really integrates the vehicle and pedestrian conflicts in your downtown. Um, it puts a lot of pressure on Main Avenue itself to provide not just access to businesses, but mobility in and out of downtown for, for vehicles, um, and then crossing movements at Main Avenue at a signalized intersection where there are, are a number of different conflicts to deal with. Mentioned this one is the, the lower, lowest cost one, but not, not by much. At 7.2 million as compared to a 7.3 million, it's really uh, apples and apples. Um, and again, it's uh, for the, the roadway construction itself is a little bit higher than some of the other alternatives, but the soil corrections not getting into that Pleasant Street connection um, and providing the, the access and mobility in that small area along 21 uh, focuses those costs in. This one too, I should point out, um, we, do, we do not include the Arcadia extension because of the mobility provided at Duluth and the, the roundabout at Duluth being the, um, the right intersection control there. I should have mentioned this earlier. If we looked at just the Duluth Avenue intersection, say everything was solved or there was no problem at 1321 um, and we have this crash problem at at Duluth, a roundabout really is the is the right solution there, in a in an isolated fashion. The alternatives that you see here, where it's three quarter, when we talk about signal, that's more from a, a corridor perspective of how to uh, how how to solve the problems overall in the corridor. I'm getting there. <laughs> Chairman Beard, Mr. Cromie, on yes. this uh, B1, I'm sorry, I told you I asked my B1 questions, but since you brought it up, um, it, these cost estimates, do they include the roundabout at Duluth as part of the solution? Th these do include the roundabout at Duluth. Good thing. Any other B1 questions? All right. So, so B2, this is, a, this is a similar approach with the combination of roundabouts and three-quarter accesses to facilitate the downtown circulation uh, within the, the 21 corridor, only it's flipped, where we have three roundabouts or, or the two primary intersections at Duluth and Maine with three-quarters at Arcadia compared to A2, which was one roundabout at Arcadia, two three quarters at Maine and, and Duluth. Um, so this one, from a traffic operation standpoint, um, works very efficiently like A2. Um, it does provide the most downtown access points because we're utilizing uh, Maine Avenue in addition to the, the investment that was made in Arcadia for access. So, so those are some similarities to other, some similar benefits that other uh, options provide. Um, because of, of the mobility at the, at, at the 1321 intersection, 
uh, this best accommodates both local and regional trips again within the, the, the highway corridor itself. Some key challenges and some key differences here is, is this one certainly has uh, more property impacts. Um, I mentioned the, the, te the about 10 property impacts before. This one is more than 20 different properties um, would likely be impacted uh, with this. So certainly a concern from a uh, acquisition standpoint. Um, we've already talked through some of the, the high crash numbers expected with the multi-lane roundabout uh, and the pedestrian yielding concerns. Uh, this one too mentioned earlier, uh, our concern for the, the highest potential for intersection blockage. If we're trying to utilize Main Avenue as a, as a, as a primary intersection, uh, doing so with two roundabouts um, is not the best way to do that. Um, likewise, and an option that, that we did remove from further consideration uh, is a traffic signal at Main Avenue with a roundabout at Highway 13. Um, because we know that, that, that there will be queues that back up at times. Um, and if we're not controlling that traffic signal in a fashion, it's gonna back into the roundabout at 1321 and really uh, shut down the regional system as a whole. So that's something that we, that we wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't consider is a roundabout at Highway 13 and a signal at, at Maine. So again, um, like the A2 option, this, this option we would expect um, less variability in travel speeds through downtown, lower than posted speed limits as traffic is, is slowed to 15 to 20 miles per hour to proceed through the, the roundabouts through here. And likewise, to, to A2, it's less burden overall on the, on the local streets, Colorado, the need for the extension down to of Arcadia down to Pleasant, um, and then some of the concerns we heard about on Dakota Avenue as well. So this option uh, comes in very close um, to the other options from a, from a cost standpoint. The fact that we have three options that are within $150,000 of one another is pretty amazing. Um, Three of the four are, are all very comparable uh, in cost. This one does reflect the, the higher property acquisition or potential for property acquisition. So I already mentioned that, you know, there are a number of variations to these, but from a corridor standpoint, an access standpoint, and a traffic control standpoint, uh, these are the four primary uh, alternatives that we'll be considering as we continue to get public input um, and more specifically public input on particular alternatives, what people like, what they don't like, what they can't live with, what they can't live without. Um, I would expect some variations to these and I think I told uh, the city administrator uh, a couple of months ago that when we get to the end here in November, it's likely it's, it's gonna be some variation or combination of, of all of these. Um, there were a few alternatives that were suggested that, that, that uh, are no longer being uh, supported or considered. Uh, a couple, I mentioned the, the, the signal at Maine with the roundabout at Highway 13. Um, that, that we just can't get to work. We can't get it to function. Uh, a number of, uh, of alternatives were suggested with that included bridges, uh, bridges for traffic, bridges for pedestrians. Uh, the, the bridges for traffic itself, um, we're not considering a bridge, say, to take a movement out of the 1321 intersection or bring Main Avenue over 21. Um, uh, quite honestly, that type of approach uh, is overkill for the type of traffic conflicts that we're, that we're trying to resolve. Uh, traffic isn't so heavy that you go up to that order of magnitude of an improvement to, to make it work. Um, for pedestrians, uh, I know that there's been suggestions for pedestrian 
uh, bridges or, or underpasses. Those are some things that we can still consider, um, whether that's across 21, across Highway 13, uh, and it gets at, you know, how do we better improve some of these concepts, um, recognizing the additional costs that come with uh, a structure such as a bridge or, or, or a tunnel. So as I mentioned, these are the, the four alternatives. Um, a couple very direct questions I have uh, for, the, for the board and the council is, is um, are there questions that you have relative to your, to understand these concepts. I realize these are very small. The left-hand side of the screen is cut off. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, if, if there are specific questions you have to, that furthers your understand, understanding for the, the basis of these alternatives, I would take that. Um, and what other information do you need from the project team to help, make, help you make an informed decision um, here as we get that later later into the year, targeting now at uh, a November timeframe. Councilmember Thompson. <clears throat> Thank you. I have what I think is a couple basic questions. Um, the three quarter access from 13 to Pleasant, is that included in all concepts? Uh, it is not included in B1. Okay. The Arcadia extension to Pleasant, which uh, concepts include that? It is included in A1 only. A1 and? A1, A1 only. A1 only. Thank you. And then the Duluth roundabout is included in all <sighs> except, no, it's it's included in both of the B concepts. Both Bs. When the B concept is where Duluth remains a primary intersection. That's all I had, thank you. Councilmember Burkhart. If I can ask, and perhaps it's inappropriate, but in my short tenure on the council, uh, I've, I've learned a, a key skill is to ask the expert. Your group being the experts right now on this, uh, as you presented them tonight, do you do you have a ranking of these yourself? We we do not have them ranked. I think what you will find as you digest this more, as you compare each of these alternatives to individual project goals, some of these alternatives are achieving the goals better or worse than others. So it really becomes, uh, it really becomes what, what goals become most important. Um, the, the alternatives that we've presented here, um, I think are considered all acceptable, that the range of conditions that they achieve uh, could be acceptable, it's just how, how do they achieve different goals, better or worse. So the, the project team itself does not have a preferred alternative. That's the intent of first informing the electorate and getting public input on the, 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 the ranking or the um, prioritization of the project goals. Uh, Council Member Braid and then uh, Chairman Beard. Um, I, I heard you say that Duluth, if it was separated out on its own, a roundabout would, would be the best to accomplish that particular intersection. Um, I guess as we look and we see that area starting to develop commercially, uh, is it in your opinion that, you know, Duluth roundabout should be an option that we should be considering maybe as, as part of all of the alternatives? That's my first question. And then my second question, is where would you recommend these uh, pedestrian crossings um, as it pertains to concept B2 and A2? So the, the answer to your first question is that uh, in, a, in an isolated condition with just the movements through the intersection of Duluth Avenue, the, the roundabout appears to be the, the right solution there. Because of the close spacing of the intersections with Arcadia, you can't 
hone in on one solution there without knowing what you do at the next intersection. Uh, I don't think that I would recommend a roundabout at Duluth and a traffic signal at Arcadia because of the, the same interaction that, that those cues could have uh, within the intersection. And then I'm gonna ask you to clarify your second question about pedestrian crossing. Sure, um, Administrator Shelton had suggested maybe using the pedestrian crossing lights um, past the roundabouts. Um, and as you look at the concepts laid before us, um, you know, specifically, are you thinking that we would have these type of pedestrian crossing lights at Maine uh, as it looks at B2 and then also as it pertains to A2, are you thinking we would have those at Maine Avenue as well or Arcadia or can you give us a little sure. bit more information? So we would, we would wanna put uh, advanced pedestrian crossing warning devices where the pedestrian demand is, where there's more, more likelihood that they're gonna be used and that drivers can expect it. So under uh, A1 and A2, that's why we would be proposing them at Main Avenue because we know that there's pedestrian crossings there today. Um, I think we've concluded that doesn't matter what we do, pedestrians are gonna cross at Maine. The demand is gonna be there. So we wanna try to accommodate them the best that we can. Um, under some of the roundabout questions, um, I think a, a candidate crossing for more advanced, um, either warning device or potential underpass is the south side of 21 as you cross Highway 13, um, being that that is designated as the Scott West Regional Trail. Um, we would expect more, more pedestrian bicycle traffic on the south side of that intersection. Um, certainly those things are, are not expense, are, are expensive, so we're not gonna add structures everywhere but it, where it would demand. Um, the other risk that you have is if you overdo it with traffic control devices, uh, it be, all becomes eyewash to the driver and they don't even realize that there's a flashing light because there's another one over there and another one over there. Um, we don't want to overwhelm um, drivers to the point where they become, be, the traffic control devices become ineffective. Chairman Beard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Cromie, just a couple of random thoughts. Uh, the trail one just popped into my head. It wasn't on my notes I wanted to ask you about, but when we rebuilt, or we built 21, we put uh, underpasses on a major east-west trail uh, just north of County Road 16 uh, while we had the place, while we were digging out a lot of muck and getting down to good soil. Uh, we put the trail under the highway right there, just a thought. Because um, this is a major east-west, it's got, uh, West Trail here. Um, just a random thought to consider between now and November or at some point in the future. Um, two things, as I look at the these maps, I notice none of them include just outright closing Main Avenue. Um, engineering decision or is that a reaction to our public comments? I think it's a, I think it's a realization that we're trying to get the corridor to fit within the, the context of the land uses that are there. Okay. Um, so no, I don't. I don't know that we ever considered removing Maine altogether from the 21 corridor. A uh, uh, follow-on question to that: um, the uh, pedestrian crossings at roundabouts. I've seen roundabouts from my perspective for a few years. Um, it, it, do we, between now and November, can you give us some comfort should we choose roundabouts as a solution? That especially during rush hour with a lot of movements and people looking over their shoulder, that pedestrian crossings in roundabouts are actually safer, as safe as we think they are. I'm thinking we probably have some practical experience in prior, in uh, New Prague, excuse me, Freudian slip. I'm looking at this, I'm flashbacking to New Prague where you have like three in a row, bing, bang, boom, and then a traffic signal. Um, just, I'm asking, I guess, for further data on that, whether they're as safe as we think they are, and as I'm, especially with multi-lane traffic in a multi-lane roundabout, um, color me just a little skeptical that pedestrians are gonna not be taking their, uh, taking a run at it, sort of like Frogger, uh, to cross those things. Third observation, uh, 101, we lifted 101 out of the floodplain, out of Shakopee into Chanhassen. 
put a big roundabout on the north end uh, to connect with County Road 61 and the new 101 coming down over the bluff. That has become a favorite back door for a lot of people crossing the river. We knew it would be. There's a free right when you're northbound, there's a free right on the Flying Cloud Drive, which in the morning works marvelously. In the evening, coming down the hill, not so much. When <clears throat> you have the same people trying to get back into town, I've seen traffic back up past Lion's Tap, trying to negotiate a multi-lane multi roundabout to do a 270 degree turn, basically, to get to the bridge to get back into Shakopee. Again, just an observation on heavy car counts. I don't know how those car counts relate to this. That might be a tidbit of information we'd want to ponder as, I, and I know your staff is already asking you that and thinking yeah, about and that. I, and I can say that, that we did evaluate whether or not an exclusive or channelized right-hand turn mm -hmm. would be necessary here, and we determined it's not. Yeah. That, that the, the multi-lane roundabout um, has the capacity with the, um, conflicts that we're dealing with to deal with it all within the roundabout itself. Typically, you, you pull those right-hand turns out and you got too many conflict points at that one spot. Uh, well, I don't have any questions. Uh, actually, Chairman Beard uh, made comment on the one area I had, which is Jake made comment on efficiency of roundabouts for vehicle flow. And the study, I believe, out of the University of Minnesota, I'd like to understand the pedestrian safety that goes along with, with the roundabouts to the degree with which they've been studied and we understand what's what's going on there. Um, <clears throat> but I, I see where we are time-wise. I don't know what you have left for slides. But as we ponder or evaluate these things, again, the objectives that we have for the corridor, each one of the alternatives you held them up against permeability of Main Street, vehicular flow. Again, Dave, I don't, or, or um, Chris, excuse me. I don't know if you have I've them in your slides. I've been called worse. <laughs> yeah, there's high praise all the way around. <laughs> uh, Mr. Cromie. Um, but uh, providing to council and commissioners and all in the council chambers, what are those priorities and objectives through which we should hold ourselves as we begin to digest roundabout versus signal versus left turn, right turn? Um, could you either draw us back to a couple of slides that would cause us to reflect back on those objectives that we have for our corridor here, or is that where you're I, gonna be at conclusion? How about if I conclude the presentation and go back and leave that up? To, to have some discussion afterwards. That would be, that would be, thank you. Uh, and Mr. Shelton, please. Just one other question before you move off of the slide. On A2, was the roundabout out of the loop because it was felt it wasn't necessary because of the roundabout at Arcadia, or was it left out because it would be impede or conflict somehow with the roundabout? Uh, it was primarily left out of A2 because Duluth Avenue would be a secondary intersection. So we would try to provide all the access within uh, the primary intersections and then the circulation to and from those. Uh, we did look at alternatives on how to try to tie Duluth and Arcadia together in a oblong roundabout and we just we couldn't get it to, to, to fit. Um, but what's proposed here really facilitates all those all those movements the same with the with the three quarter left turn to Duluth coming out with the right hand turn you can make a, a U turn uh, quite well it facilitates the same movements in a more compact uh, footprint. City Manager Boyles. Just a point of clarification. Do I understand that any option that incorporates a roundabout jeopardizes the federal funding? Any option I, with a roundabout? I think, I think that, the, that going from a signalized intersection to a roundabout would, would warrant a review of the scope at the Met Council. Thank you. Next steps. The mayor already mentioned 
Um, we are going to get this presentation information out, out on our website um, and start seeking uh, input as soon as we possibly can. I know the, the survey questions on each of these alternatives and how they compare, how any one individual uh, ranks them relative to the project goals and some of the things we're trying to achieve should be going out in about 10 minutes. Um, and we'll get this information up on moving forward 2113.com uh, just as soon as, as we can. Uh, I had an earlier slide that laid out where we're going to be in the future. I just want to call attention to the October 10th uh, public open house is scheduled. Um, that's really going to be a, a cornerstone of some of the public input that we're seeking here starting tomorrow, I guess starting tonight, um, starting tonight and, and on through the, the end of October. Uh, as we're seeking public input, there's still a, a lot of coordination and evaluation that city, state, um, county, and consultant staff needs to, needs to work through, including addressing some of the questions we heard here tonight. Um, we have, we've had some involvement at MnDOT. We have not had enough MnDOT involvement at this point. Um, so that's going to continue as well. Um, but what we would like to do is to narrow this down to a preferred alternative where at that point in November, you asked me what the staff's priority or preferred alternative is, we'll be ready for that in November. Um, and that's when we would initiate the, the municipal consent process and that, and that would then initiate uh, the county's ability to start purchasing uh, property for, for the improvement. Um, real, real quickly, because I know that, that there's been questions about municipal consent and what, what does that mean? Um, in the state of Minnesota, there is a, a municipal consent law that uh, requires, uh, requires MnDOT or the road authority to receive a resolution from the city council um, when they alter access, increase or reduce traffic capacity or buy permanent right away within that community. Uh, in this case, um, we do expect that we will be altering access and we do expect to be acquiring permanent right away. Uh, the traffic capacity, what that means is we're, we're not expanding a, lane, a roadway from two to four lanes. Uh, we are adding turn lanes and we're adding capacity to the intersection, but it's not the intent of the municipal consent law to add turn lanes to justifying the traffic capacity increase. Um, so this process, uh, we would initiate this when we feel like we have a preferred alternative, something that MnDOT provides some assurances that they're not going to change it, they're on board uh, with uh, what's being proposed. Um, the process that, that occurs is a, a formal letter is submitted to the city from the road authority, in this case it would be Scott County, um, requesting municipal consent and include a good faith cost estimate as to what the city's costs would be and it would illustrate the right of way access changes that are being proposed. At the point that the official request comes in, the city has uh, a requirement to hold a public hearing uh, on the particular project uh, within 60 days and then act upon a resolution within 90 days of the public hearing. So it's necessary that we, that we do this, not just because the law requires it, uh, but because for us to move forward with a commitment from all the agencies as to what is going to be built, what we're buying right away for, um, we don't want to be making major changes to the what um, when we're down the road of already purchased property, we got plans out on the street and contractors uh, ready to go. Um, so that's the municipal consent process in a nutshell. Again, for city council members, we can, we can talk in more detail. Um, about that when the, when the time comes. I should add, this is a choice on the city's behalf. Um, if, if the staff approved or staff recommendation um, proceeds and the city council approves a resolution adopting that, that layout, the project moves forward. If there are still some issues that we need to work out, um, a couple of things could happen. Uh, MnDOT or Scott County could, uh, 
could try to meet the changes that are being requested by the city, try to resolve any remaining issues so that a, a clean approval can be provided by the city. Uh, there is an appeals process that is, is used on rare occasions um, when the road authority uh, simply has to move the project forward and you can't come to a, a resolution um, with the city. That appeals process is spelled out. It's a three-person board. City adopts one person. The road authority adopts another. And then you agree to the third person. They make the decision. Or they hear both sides and then make a, a decision. Uh, lastly, if municipal consent isn't granted, uh, the project could be either modified so that it's not required or the project could be stopped uh, altogether. So maybe that wasn't quite municipal consent in a nutshell, um, but I know that there have been some questions being asked about uh, that process and I wanted to cover that. That is the end of my presentation. Um, I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, two hours is a long time. This is the scratching the surface of the information that, that we have. But again, the primary objective here was to uh, develop an understanding of what alternatives we're moving forward, moving forward with and continuing to evaluate and, and receive public input. Uh, all this information is gonna be on our moving forward 13-21.com website that's a, that you can access as, as elect elected officials, uh, the public can access that as well, and I encourage you to, to do so. Um, we will uh, keep that information up to date. Mr. Uh, Mayor. If I could uh, just add on to this, um, and for all, when you do access the Moving Forward 1321 site, there's going to be a fresh survey awaiting you as well looking for your input. So as you see here on the slide, we want to hear from you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Cromie, if you could, again, the, uh, the priorities for our corridor, just to bring them up, just to orient, orient us towards the lens through which we're going to want to evaluate these alternatives um, to make sure that um, as we m move towards a municipal consent dis decision, the, uh, the priorities through which we are uh, weighing in are um, are f clearly understood and, and discussed, but um, I'd also, and then I'd like to hand it over to uh, um, Chairman Beard here. I wanna thank uh, the engineering team. I mean, I'm looking to my right, Kate Miner, Lisa Fries, Larry Poplar, see Matt here with us. Um, I see many um, Bolton and Mink consultant engineers. I see county engineers. This has been a ton of work, a ton of meetings and a good deal of communication. The one thing I've heard time and time again is we've never seen it this way before. We've never done it this way before. It's the first time I believe there've been three joint meetings on a project between county commissioners and council. And I wanna thank my fellow commissioners for coming here to Prior Lake, um, for again, weighing in on these very important decisions and we're doing this together. So again, my thanks to the engineering team for what we've seen this evening. Um, and my thanks to um, my fellow um, officials here for all of your uh, efforts. Um, and with that, uh, Mike, uh, any, any comments, closing comments you might have? Thank you uh, for pushing the red button for me. <laughs> I think I'd never done this before. <laughs> no, we're, uh, we're glad to be part of this, uh, uh, this presentation and as we can, this consideration as we develop. I know we've been over this ground or pre people prior to us have done this before. It's our turn. It's our turn to step up, take a fresh look, uh, see what's changed, uh, see what has developed in the engineering world and some of the data that we uh, uh, need to consider and we're glad to do that with you. So uh, we appreciate being here, and uh, again, thanks for the uh, good presentation and for considering our request for a little more data, Mr. Cromie and your team, and we'll look forward to the open house on October 10th. Tremendous, thank you so much.